Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's An Nur the Light. November is Disability Rights Awareness Month, which gives us an opportunity to showcase some exceptional people. Rida Desai is more than an ambassador for people with disabilities. He is a role model and we got to hang out with him. Too often people with disability are seen to not do much for themselves, but in many cases this is just not so. After a tragic motor vehicle accident, Rida Desai's life changed forever. Look, for me the biggest thing after the accident was knowing that I was alive was the biggest thing for me. I mean, a lot, a lot of us go through that moment, what if I ever get knocked out or something happens to me immediately, how would I react? I mean, we think about it all the time, but until it really happens, do you know how to react to that man? Firstly, one of, I was very at ease because it could have been worse. One of the most difficult steps to recovery is coming to terms with what has happened. Lucky for Rida, the Brave Foundation was on hand to assist in this regard. Well, what we do at Brave really is underpinned and completely formed by the yogic teachings. And the yogic teachings, I guess, they're a million little tools and different breathing techniques, different physical movement practices, and those are taught to people specifically like a prescription depending on what the condition is, what the trauma is, what stage of recovery you're in. Maybe you need to ground more and calm the nervous system in the earlier stages. Maybe in the later stages you now need a bit of a challenge to build confidence and a surety in yourself. So we deploy or teach different techniques at different stages of recovery to really create wellness and confidence and self-empowerment. I basically started my rehab with the Brave Foundation immediately after my, basically you can say about three weeks after my accident. And what it taught me was about holistic healing and also just getting my body's body functions up and running again through movement and breathing. Um, it really helped me um, get rid of my pain firstly, and then also, um, started allowing me to breathe properly, which was something I couldn't do at the start. And that's why I'm very thankful for the, to the Brave Foundation for what they've done for, to me and for me, because it allowed me to see that if I by myself put, get my mind right, my body will for sure get there. The road to recovery is often a slow process and with it comes many downfalls. One of the most important factors that can be an invaluable help is support you receive from those around you. My biggest blessing is my support structure. My family, my friends, um, the people I work with. All these people really added value to my life because I knew I was loved, I knew I was needed and I knew I needed to get out of the situation I was in. They ensured that I could go places, see people, see things, enjoy life. And I mean, they very tight to me and, and I cherish them for every moment. We're only as good as our support structure. And that is very evident in the way my life changed. Rida is not the kind of person to let any kind of adversity get him down. He threw himself with zeal into getting better, even joining a ballroom dance group and becoming a local champion. I went back to work about nine months after my accident, which wasn't the ideal scenario because, I mean, I was still in a healing state. Um, I started uh, wheelchair dancing basically the June of the following year, and that helped me tremendously. I mean, I think the social aspects um, being able to interact with other people. Seeing children was the biggest, biggest blessing for me because I saw a lot of kids in wheelchairs and they were born like that. That made me realize that I have still so much to be grateful for. Some may say it takes great courage to come back after such a tragedy, but Rida has his own trump card, Allah. Allah, 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 Allah. I mean, I said it's stranger to some people that I feel like I asked for this in my du'as because, I mean, my life was so hectic before, work, sport, social life. I mean, I never really sat down and thought about what I was doing. I just went out and did. What, what happened was, and I realized that, listen here, 
Allah has pulled me closer to Him because now I actually need to concentrate on what's important in life instead of being all over the place and too busy. And that's how I think Islam has played a part in my life that I've actually grown close to it since my accident. Rida is living proof that no matter what tragedy life throws at you, there is hope. Not only has he embraced his condition, he has also become a role model to others who have found themselves in similar situations. The power of the heart, mind and belief are human traits that allow us to conquer even the most debilitating challenges. <laughs> It really is amazing what some people can achieve, no matter their circumstances. Molana Zakaria Falanda is standing by with this week's Q&A. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Molana Zakaria Falanda. Welcome to this segment of Q&A on Anur the Light. Our first question for today came to us from our Facebook page. Assalamu alaikum. Can the name Baraka be given to a girl child? The name Baraka, it means blessing, and it can be given to a girl child. It is important in Islam that when we give any name, that we should always aspire to give names that are good, and that when we mention the name and the child grows up with this name, it will be something that inspires good in the child. The name Baraka, it means blessings. It is something which the child can always aspire to be under, under the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next question was mailed to us by one of our loyal viewers. According to Islam, what is the best way to honor your parents? The best way to honor your parents is to be dutiful to them and to be thankful to them always. Allah says in the Quran, Anishkur li, be grateful to me, meaning be grateful to God, wali walidayk, and be grateful to your two parents. Another way that you can be dutiful to them is to treat them in a kind manner and never to speak to them in a degrading manner. The Quran says, وَلَا تَكُلَّهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرُهُمَا وَكُلَّهُمَا كَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Do not say to them a word even such as uf. Do not chase them away. And when you speak to them, only say to them kind, noble words. وَكُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا And you should make constant prayer for them. ارْحَمْهُمَا O God, safeguard them, have mercy on them as they safeguarded me and they had mercy on me when I was young. So in Islam, it is extremely important to be dutiful to the parents and being dutiful means to respect them, to honor them, to take care of them at all times. Lastly, we were asked, according to Islam, besides pork, what other foods can be seen as haram? In Islam, the, the ruling is that all foods are considered lawful except those foods which are explicitly mentioned to be unlawful pork being one of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentions that all those animals that have been slaughtered in other than the name of Allah, they are not lawful to consume. Blood is not lawful to consume. Any animal that died as a result of natural causes or have been gored or that died as a result of an accident is also not allowed to be consumed. And then there's a fine ruling in Islam also that any animal that is considered detestable and this is subjective, but any animal that is considered detestable is not allowed to consume. That brings us to the end of this Q&A segment on An-Nur. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Shukran for sending us those questions. There are some really strange ones and some thought-provoking. Please don't forget to send us your upcoming events as our calendar is getting full. We can be reached via email or social media. Details on screen. Hijab comes into focus today as we look at the choices of women who wear it. Traditionally observing the hijab is a practice of obtaining closeness to Allah, an act of worship for women to be protected and their statuses elevated. The reasons why women choose to wear the hijab or the veil today are multifaceted and reject the Western stereotype that associates the practice with oppression and submissiveness. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said in, uh, 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 in hadith that إِذَا فَاتَقَ الْحَيَا فَفْعَلْ مَا شِئْتَ Right. And also that uh, modesty is half of Iman. That without modesty, that half of your Iman is lost. Iman is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet. Understand? And then together with that, you have to bring modesty. Hijab to me is more than just the outer. It starts from within. 
And for me, that verse with the Almighty gives us the instruction to lower your gaze is really where hijab starts. It starts from within your heart. Um, that modesty, that you are not available to other men, you are your husbands. And that's really for me what uh, hijab is about. Even, even within our own Muslim community, there's a big misunderstanding that, you know, hijab is just a scarf that you wear on your head. And, um, you know, although dressing modestly and covering your hair, of course, is like a huge part of it and it is a huge part of, you know, showing that you are a Muslim, that's by no means the full extent of what hijab is. Hijab is, you know, so much so an, a kind of all-encompassing concept of modesty. So it's modesty in your behavior, modesty in your speech, modesty in your dress. As the concept of hijabi or fashionable hijab takes social media by storm, we start to see how it is expressed in different contexts. So my honours research paper is entitled Hashtag Hijab Fashion, um, Contesting Images of Hijab in New Media. And basically what I'm looking at is how in the past five years or so young particularly young Muslim women have kind of subverted new media platforms like YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and um, are kind of creating their own narrative of themselves as a counter to the whole, you know, oppressed woman, um, hidden behind veils, oppressed by patriarchy kind of narrative. But what I'm, what I'm seeking to establish is also to what extent is this counter narrative in itself problematic? Is it a matter of us saying that we, our faith, um, in our, when we're showing it in our dressing is only acceptable when it's done by Western standards. Are we saying that, you know, we need validation by, by the West and what they deem to be fashionable um, for hijab as a concept to be accepted? South Africa is a melting pot of different cultures and within it we find Muslims from all backgrounds. The beauty of culture is that it too comes with its own traditions and influences and this has largely impacted the way Muslim women Women identify themselves as Muslims, as South Africans, and as belonging to their culture. As you can see, I'm wearing an African uh, print right now, an African dress, and so um, I identify a lot with that. It's as a black Muslim woman, um, I feel that it's pertinent to express yourself in a way that identifies you to your culture, but that doesn't necessarily take you away from, you know being a Muslim of some sort because we all express ourselves differently. I live in South Africa, sunny South Africa, the rainbow nation. Um, for me, as a person that is in the public eye from time to time, um, I think it's very important that we as adults dress in a way that is still appealing to the youth. Ultimately, you do want the youth to have role models to look up to and you are still within the fold of Islam. So for me that balance is very, very important. Fashion designer and creator of higher designs, Zainab Ndebele wears niqab or the veil. As an African Muslim woman, she believes that hijab is not a hindrance but a means by which she stays true to her identity. Non-Muslims, they think that hijab is about maybe it's worn by women who are married. And since misconceptions that are there, that women who are married, women whose husbands have passed away, you know, there's a whole lot of stories that are going around. You don't understand that hijab is about covering so that you don't have to be seen by people that are not your, your, mehar, your mehram, people that are strangers to, to you, so that uh, when you go out there, you're covering the beauties only for your, for your husband. Islam in the locations, as we come from Soweto, is like when they see black clothing, then they think that's Islam. And then when we come and dress in African prints, dresses, like we, we try to show them that hijab is you covering your body. I'd express myself as an African woman by, um, I identify a lot with colors and, you know, printing as an African woman. That's something that is kept close to me. As hijab breaks out into fashion pages, as it is interpreted in different contexts, and as more and more women choose to express themselves with a unique style, hijab remains a protection and form of identity for Muslim women around the world. At Endur the Light, we're always probing, always questioning, and always giving you the opportunity to make up your own mind. That topic was certainly food for thought. We're heading back to the beautiful KwaZulu Natal for this week's travel segment. 
cemetery in Durban Central can be regarded as one of the oldest in the city. Here lie the remains of some of the early pioneers and amongst them in the Muslim section is the tomb of Bacha Pier. The Bacha Pier Cemetery is one of the oldest cemeteries in South Africa, especially in the KwaZulu-Natal area. And it houses the tomb of the Mazar Sharif of the Grama, a very great Sufi saint that is Hazrat Sheikh Ahmad Bacha Pier, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alim. And it is home, and people pay homage to this tomb and to this Mazar Sharif from all walks of life. You'll find this Mazar Sharif from the time it opens up in the morning, right till the time it closes in the afternoon. People from all walks of life, all different creeds, races, colors, coming and pay, paying homage to this great saint. You'll find people coming, sitting down, reading, reciting, or just playing, sitting down, trying to get some form of calm, peace, tranquility from this friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tombs of saints found in and around Durban are much revered by the community. Visitors come from near and far to pay their respects at the graves of these holy people. The graveyard of a believer is a garden from the gardens of paradise. And like rain, when it hits, touches the ground, it splashes. The rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well the same. When it descends upon the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it splashes. So those around them will be affected by that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all those that have any difficulty, be it financial, be it marital, be it social, if they do come and sit at the uh, uh, sanctity or the garden of a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then automatically, spiritually, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will descend upon them and they will get some form of relief or uh, tranquility or peace from the day-to-day -day hardships. Hazrat Bacha Pia appeals to people of all faiths and from different walks of life. His grave is one of the most visited sites in Durban and his contribution to the early development of Islam is well documented. One man's craving can become another man's plate of food and so it was for the owner of Cereal Killers who opened up a place where he could indulge in some of his favourite cereals. The idea behind Cereal Killers is that when I went out for breakfast, I couldn't get any cereal. So I decided to open the first store in South Africa that serves cereal. We serve cereal, uh, some of the import cereals like uh, Frosties, uh, Fruit Loops, etc. And golden nuggets that's from the UK. We serve eggs, sausages, your breakfast uh, type of thing, bacon uh, and coffee. Advertising was done by word of mouth and social media. Very soon this became one of the hip and happening places to be seen at. The menu was then expanded to cater for a more diverse clientele. I'd encourage anyone to come here because it's a laid back atmosphere which uh, a person can come relax, have a nice cup of coffee, have a breakfast, have a lunch and use the Wi-Fi. So it's midweek, we are very business oriented uh, 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 coffee shop and weekends we are family oriented coffee shop. So people on the weekends are like kids and people, kids scribbling on the wall and running around. The halal food scene in Durban shows no sign of letting up, with more and more innovative places popping up almost every month. Cereal Killers is definitely a place to try out as one gets to rub shoulders with the locals who have made this a favourite hangout. Kayak fishing can be best described as an unforgettable adventure sport that is fast becoming a local favourite. Basically what we do is we, we're fishing or fishing kayaks. Um, it's a great way to, to get fit at the same time as well as get out there and actually get some fish for the table and uh, to enjoy the, the beautiful scenery here in Durban. At first sight it may look simple, but there is some skill involved in as one has to navigate the waves when setting out. I take guys, I do the training from the, from the ground up, so I'll teach them how to get through the surf and uh, basic handling and safety on a kayak, right to fishing trips away to Mozambique and Northern Zululand and local. While there is much effort that goes into kayak fishing, the reward is fitting. One cannot get any closer to catching a fish other than spearfishing or diving and the thrill of it all gets the blood pumping. Fishing from a kayak, basically you are the master of your own destiny, so it's all do it yourself. You can carry, you can load the kayak, you can launch just about anywhere on the north coast provided that there's not too many rocks and it's safe to do so. You can get out there, you can catch fish, it's relatively inexpensive, you don't have the overheads like fuel and wanting crew to go to go kayak fishing, so you can do it yourself pretty much. Next time you're in Durban, why not try something different and get in touch with the guys at Guided Safaris for an experience that you can literally take home.
I hope you've been taking down notes of all the places to go, things to do, and most importantly, where to eat, especially since most of you will be heading out for the holidays soon. That's all that we have time for this week, but we'll be back next week with more inspiring stories. From me, Mara Mokwanda, Salang Hantle. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>